Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Library Learnix Scholastic Author Event, We Are Not Alone, Finding Community and Self in Story. Please let us know where you're joining us from in the chat. We miss you. We really look forward to sharing books with you again in person. But until that beautiful moment, it's incredible that we're able to connect with so many of you here. We know you're joining us from across the country, um, and we love having you with us to talk books um, and share these wonderful authors. Today, we are so lucky to have five creators joining us to share more about their incredible books coming out this year. These books are ones you should know. They represent so many different perspectives and shine light on important and impactful truths. Engaging with these books brings us into community with each other and helps us to understand more about ourselves and the world around us. Our first author speaker is a rising star who we are thrilled to add to our Scholastic Graphics list. Kat Fajardo's debut middle grade graphic novel, Miss Quinces, is the first graphic novel from graphics to be simultaneously released in English and Spanish. Kat is a Honduran Colombian award winning cartoonist and illustrator, originally from New York City and now living in Austin, Texas. Kat, these are two great library cities and states. Kat is a graduate of the School of Visual Arts, and you may have seen some of her work, including the cover for the first rule of punk. Kat, welcome, and take it away. Hello, hi. Um, thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Um, so, uh, Ms. Keen says, uh, as was presented is my debut graphic novel for middle grade readers. It's a fun coming of age story about a young girl named Sue who would rather do anything else than celebrate her own quinceanera. As a nerdy 15 year old, all Sue wants to do for summer vacation is read and make comics with her pals at sleepaway camp, but unfortunately that doesn't happen for her. Instead, Sue is stuck visiting family in Honduras alongside her parents and two annoying sisters. They live out way in the country, which means no cable TV, no cell phones, and most importantly, no internet, which is a nightmare for Sue. And to make matters worse, Sue's mom surprises her with the news that they're going to have a quinces there, despite Sue's protests. So the pair strike a deal. If Sue goes along with the quinces without any complaints, she can go to camp with her friends later that summer. But between dance practice, wild turkeys, and her overeager family, Sue doesn't know how she'd be able to take it all. So will she be able to hold up her end of the bargain and make it to camp? You're gonna have to read it to find out. But I had a blast creating this story with my awesome Scholastic team. It's actually a semi-autobiographical story based on my own experience as a quinceanera in Honduras. And it's very close to my heart. Um, like Sue, I was a very reluctant teen. I didn't want to have my own quinces, um, but after much convincing from my family, I did end up having one, um, and I didn't regret it one bit. And, you know, I was able to um, become part of a beautiful family tradition, which was really amazing, and I had a transformative experience that summer. So I wanted to share that experience through my story for readers. And this book is for everyone, um, whether they've had quinces growing up or for young readers who are expecting to have one soon, or even for readers who have no idea what a quinces is. Um, I've done extensive research on certain ceremonial objects and rituals used in traditional quince ceremonies. So you'll be able to learn more about it um, in the back of the book, which was really fun for me to do. Um, and I honestly learned so much from it. <laughs> and I'm very excited to say that um, Ms. Quintus will be the first graphic novel published by Scholastic Graphics to be simultaneously released in English and Spanish editions, which is like super amazing. Um, this was, you know, this is exciting because like everyone can enjoy the story, especially kids and their Spanish speaking parents, which is something I wish I had growing up with my parents. Um, so super exciting. And, you know, Ms. Quintus is a recommended book for those who enjoyed heartfelt stories about navigating the expectations of family and cultural traditions. And most importantly, learning how to embrace your otherness, whatever that may be, and wear your identity with pride, kind of like a tiara. Um, so I'm so excited for everyone to read it. 
Um, our team poured so much love and hard work into this story, and I'm so thrilled for you to meet Sue and her family. Thank you. Kat, thank you so much. That was wonderful. This book is pure unbridled joy, and I can confirm that anybody um, will be able to enjoy it. And oh my gosh, the back matter, those photos, it's wonderful. Thank you so much. Our next author is no stranger to Scholastic. Alice Austin Lived Here is Alex's fourth book with Scholastic. And we are thrilled to be introducing that title in April alongside the now correctly named Melissa, which we know librarians have been instrumental in supporting and advocating for. Thank you. Melissa was Alex's first novel and won the Children's Stonewall Award, the Lambda Literary Award, and the Children's Book Choice, Children's Choice Book Awards, among a host of others. Their subsequent books, You Don't Know Everything, Jilly P and Rick, received many accolades and starred reviews as well. Alex, welcome. Hi there. I am glad to be here. Uh, like Emily said, my first book. Melissa is now properly named and I am excited to have the new copies on the shelves next April, but I am here to tell you about my new love, which is Alice Austin lived here. It may be the book I'm proudest of. It may be the book that I'm most excited to share. First of all, I love the cover. I know you got a, a pretty fancy cover somewhere, somewhere around me, but it takes place on Staten Island and it's got the ferry on it. It's got the Statue of Liberty on it. And it's got these two non-binary best friends who are just everything, everything that I want them to be and more. Um, they're, my first book had a trans kid alone and she had support, but she was the only trans kid she knew about. And I don't plan to do that anymore. This book is filled with community. This book is filled with connection. It is contemporary, but it takes place on Staten Island, which is where I grew up. Staten Island, one of the boroughs of New York City. So I connect with it. But I also imbued it with so much of people connecting with each other. And that's why I'm excited to share it with you. So Sam, my main character uh, is non-binary and he lives in the same building that I grew up in when I was a kid. And they have a best friend down the block named TJ and they have neighbors upstairs, which is a, a queer family, uh, Jess, Val, and their baby Evie. And um, Sam spent a lot of time with them. And where we come into the book is where TJ and Sam have just received a project that they need to do. Uh, to pre present someone as a statue to go up at Borough Hall of a local member of, his a local person of historic um, significance. And that's a challenge for them because most of the people who you hear about in history are dead white straight men. And that's not who they want to write about. That's not who they want to share about. They come across Alice Austin, who is real. Uh, she was a photographer at the end of the 19th century. And she took a lot of street photos on Manhattan and Staten Island, but she also took these amazing photos of her friends. And she was queer. That was not the language she used at the time, uh, but she did say she lived the, les no, excuse me, she lived the larky lifestyle. And she had a partner of over 50 years named Gertrude. And in the process of finding out about Alice, Sam and TJ learn that their older neighbor downstairs, Leslie, is also a lesbian and who met Alice Austin because Alice Austin at one point lived in that building, which is in fact true. And I learned as an adult that Alice Austin was queer and that she had lived in my building. And it's fantastic to have found out, but as an adult, it's a queer connection that I didn't have as a kid. And I wish I'd had. And so I'm excited that kids now can have that. Um, they choose a photograph for this statue that is just beautiful. It is two pairs of women embracing um, at the waist. And 
and it's not sexual in any way, but it is extremely romantic. And you can tell that these women love each other. And I love the idea of living in a world where even in a book, that can be at Staten Island's Borough Hall. It is a story of queer community. It's a story of chosen family. It's about mentors. And it's basically like queer fan fiction of my own childhood. And I am delighted to share it with all of you. And I'm delighted for you to share it with all of your patrons. Thank you so much, Alex. That was wonderful. I think this book really addresses some important questions about who we want to remember, who we want to memorialize and commemorate. Um, and as always, you contribute so much to a sense of community for readers. So thank you. Thank you. I'm delighted to share it. I can't tell you how thrilled I am to welcome our next author, Co Booth, back to Scholastic with her first new book, <laughs> the middle grade title, Kind of Like Brothers. Her first novel, Tyrell, received many accolades, including the Los Angeles Times Book Prize for Young Adult Fiction, and was recently named by Time as one of the 100 best YA novels of all time. Time, well done. Co followed that title with two additional YA novels, Kendra and Bronxwood, before her first middle grade title, Kind of Like Brothers. Her upcoming middle grade novel, Caprice, releases April 5th. Co, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. And thanks to everyone who's here for all that you do. Uh, just a few days ago, my sister and I were reminiscing about the library bookmobile that used to come to our neighborhood in the Bronx and how exciting it was seeing all those books. And then a few years later, we got a real library in our neighborhood, and that was like mind blowing to us. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I'm really excited to introduce my new book, Caprice. I guess you could say it's a companion novel to my previous novel, Kind of Like Brothers. But now we're following Jarrett's friend and secret love interest, Caprice. Uh, Caprice is 12 years old and she's just coming back from spending the majority of the summer away at a leadership program. Um, and now she's just kind of trying to fit herself back into her regular life after having such an awesome life-changing experience. Um, on the surface, Caprice is the kind of kid that you would say is okay. Like she gets good grades, she has friends, she doesn't get in trouble, she's better than okay. Um, but inside, she's not really okay. Um, during the book, you see that she's really struggling and she has been for a while. Um, she's at the age where she's starting to really understand some things that happened to her when she was much younger, back when she used to live with her grandmother and her uncle, who was a teenager at the time. Now that she's 12, she can fully understand that the things that had seemed like games with her uncle were in fact sexual abuse. And for the first time, like she's feeling the violation of that and it's overwhelming to her. It's, she can't deny it anymore. So during the week that the book spans, we watch Caprice take the first steps toward understanding it and speaking out and reaching out for help. In order to tell this story, I had to write it in a different way than I've written anything else before. Uh, so it was kind of scary and kind of fun at the same time. Um, a lot of this book deals with with uh, Caprice's past. So the best way to tell that was in flashbacks. So there are lots of flashbacks to her early childhood and they're all kind of presented in a haphazard way. They're, they're out of order. They don't really make any sense. And um, it's, I was trying to like capture the way Caprice is actually experiencing these flashbacks as she's trying to piece together everything that happened. It's like puzzle pieces that are all scattered all over the place. And there are also poems in this book. And um, yes, this is my first time dabbling in poetry. Um, but the poems are the poems that Caprice is actually writing in her secret poetry notebook. And 
poems that she's writing in her poetry class from the community center. Um, I wanted the poetry to reflect what she's really thinking and feeling, things that she's not ready to talk about yet, not to anybody. So I had a lot of fun writing these poems and I hope you like them. <laughs> Um, at the heart of this book, though, is a child who is dealing with the aftermath, the aftermath of sexual abuse. And I know this is a serious topic, but it's an important one. Um, I know this book might be challenging for some readers, but it's the one I needed to tell because I know that there are kids who, who will see themselves and others in it. Um, before I was a writer, I worked as a child protective specialist, specializing in children who had been sexually abused. So I know that there are so many kids who are carrying around traumas, either from their present day life or from their past. And, you know, this is the way they're living their life. They're carrying around so much pain. And before I worked for child protective services, I was that kid who was carrying around pain and confusion from my own traumas when I was a child. So um, I guess I wrote this book because it's the book that I wanted to read when I was younger. And it's the book that I wish I had. <laughs> um, I think sometimes there's a tendency to shield kids from uncomfortable and painful things in books, even when we know they're experiencing those things in real life. So I wanna thank all of you for helping to get books into the hands of kids. Um, I really appreciate everything you do, not only as a writer, but also as that kid <laughs> that, that I used to be waiting for the bookmobile. So thank you so much. Thank you, Co. And and we know we know that there are readers out there who need this book and who who are going to have this pressed into their hands by librarians who who love them and see them. Um, librarians out there, we know we know the work you're doing. We know how you connect through bookmobiles, through libraries, <laughs> through other outreach services. Um, this is going to be a really important book. Thank you so much, Co. Thank you. Our next author is the one and only Sonia Manzano. You might know that Sonia left Sesame Street, but she is still part of PBS. Her animated series, Alma's Way, debuted this past October. Sonia's television writing won her 15 Emmy Awards, and she's also the recipient of a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Academy of Arts and Sciences. Her first book was Scholastic, The Revolution of Evelyn Serrano, won a Pura Belpre honor, and her most recent book is the autobiographical young adult title, Becoming Maria. We are thrilled to have her next book with us, the young adult title, Coming Up Cuban. Sonia, welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Emily. It's a real pleasure for me to be here. Greetings, librarians and everybody else attending. Of course, we all wish we could be together in person, but this is a good instead of. I'm extra excited because if memory serves me correctly, the last time I was with you all was 2015. And it was the moment that I announced that I was retiring from Sesame Street. Actually, I, I mentioned it casually in one of my comments. Well, some of the librarians tweeted it creatively. Some said, goodbye, Big Bird, hello, books. Anyway, by the time I got back to New York, it was all the news that I had left Sesame Street, and I have you librarians to thank for that. Thank you very much. Your theme, We Are Not Alone, Finding Community and Self and Story is almost tailor-made for my book, Coming Up Cuban. Coming Up Cuban is a story of what happens to four Cuban kids during Castro's revolution in 1959. It is told in four distinct voices with four different points of view. Though I'm not Cuban, the twists and turns and dichotomy of Caribbean people have always interested me. I was struck that if poverty drove my own Puerto Rican family to the mainland in the 1940s, leaving middle-class Puerto Ricans behind, the opposite happened to Cubans because of the revolution. Political unrest drove Cubans to the United States in 1959, leaving many impoverished Cubans behind on the island. 
In both cases, though, families were suddenly torn apart. Young people were thrown into different environments and forced to find and make communities or wither. These children and their families had to deal with changes of customs, language, and of course, as you could imagine, from the Caribbean weather. Here's how Coming Up Cuban came to be. I was at a cocktail party and I heard a true story about an American boy whose father had a chicken farm in Cuba in 1959. When Castro nationalized the country's industries, sadly, sadly, the family dog was left behind as well. Sometime later though, the dog showed up in Miami on a refugee boat. The boy and the dog were reunited. This is true. Well, I immediately saw that as a possible simple picture book. But my supportive and creative editor at Scholastic, Andrea Pickney, saw something else. She said, you know, this just might be a full-fledged YA or middle grade book. Poke around, see if something occurs to you. So I did. While researching, I, I quickly learned how situations changed for everybody in Cuba. Suddenly, Cuban social classes had to redefine themselves and find other ways to live. Now, of course, I was most interested in the effects that the Cuban revolution had on the very young, how changes, how these changes affect the 12 and 13 year olds torn, thrown into this new circumstance. Well, by this time I was deeply in it. I was immersing myself in this topic. So I did further research. And here I'm glad for the opportunity to thank two people with the University of Miami's Cuban Heritage Library Collection, who's helped me tremendously with my research. I couldn't have done it without them. One was librarian Mayolette Mendez and community relations advocate for the library, Gladys Gomez, they guided this Puerto Rican woman through the ins and outs of Cuban history of that time. They showed me photos, they suggested books, and they even shared personal stories. And one of the stories, and I'm not going to say which ones to protect their privacy, she told me she remembers shopping for shoes on her birthday in Havana, and then suddenly finding herself in New York City. She recalls suddenly feeling that the world had lost all its color, which you can understand coming from a Caribbean island and suddenly waking up in Queens. And that image stayed with me. Anyway, because of this library and the people who ran it, I learned about revolutionary zeal gone wrong, unaccompanied minors sent to the USA and political initiatives meted out to those left behind. I imagined how those changes might have affected young Cubans when you're just on the cusp of making sense of who you are and forming opinions about the world around yourself. Well, then I got to work telling these tales through the fictitious lives of Ana Miguel, Sulema, and Juan. Ana is the disenchant disenchanted daughter of a revolutionary. Miguel is part of the Operation Pedro Pan program, which was a uh, sending unaccompanied minors to the USA by parents who feared for their safety. Sulema is an illiterate Guajira peasant girl struggling with yearnings of her own. And Juan, a poor Afro-Cubano living in a Havana slum who struggles with his feelings of loyalty. Our writer's conceit I use is that though the stories are separate, the reader, not the characters, but the reader sees their lives, the characters' lives brush up against one another. In any historical fiction, which coming up Cuban is, you have to find ways of sharing historical facts without sounding like a history lesson. The writer Louise Erdrich, who writes about Native American experience, puts it this way. She said she embeds historical facts in a story like sneaking spinach into the school lunches of her children. So I find a way of embedding hysterical facts, not hysterical, historical facts, by doing it through the lives of strong characters. The best characters are those who reveal themselves to me, who take on a life of their own. 
I needed the character of Anna to tell the story of the opening days of the revolution. And she revealed herself to me by ending up being a smart aleck. Miguel is a participant of Operation Pedro Pan. He's shy, middle class, semi-pampered boy who suddenly finds himself in what was then known in those days as a reform school, surrounded by what was then known in those days, juvenile delinquents. Well, he somehow finds it in himself to become a leader. Sulema is a Guajira peasant girl who yearns for more because she's smart. And it comes through her through Castro's literacy initiative. But her story focuses more on where she ultimately finds herself in her society. And even more importantly, her relationship with her father. An example of how she haunts me is that she turned up in Lynn manuel Miranda's movie, In the Heights. In that movie, a father tells the daughter, you are finally better than me. And the daughter asks why? And he answers, because you can see a future I can't. I immediately thought, oh, that's Sulema. She would have that kind of exchange with her father. As a mother loves all her children, I love all the characters that I write about in Coming Up Cuban, but I love my final character, Afro-Cuban Juan, the best. He has to resist joining a militaristic program that doesn't interest him, even while losing the affection of his best friend. The more I wrote about him, the more noble he became to me in my eyes. Sometimes I think it takes a village to make the book. And if librarians help me with the research at the beginning of this journey, fellow writers of Cuban descent, Margarita Engel and Meg Medina informed my final take on coming up Cuban. And I appreciate the time they took to share their life experience with me. My parents used to use an expression, buscarse la vida, to describe why they migrated to the mainland from Puerto Rico in the 1940s. Buscarse la vida means to find your life. I was often reminded of my parents' Puerto Rican expression while crafting these narratives and voices of the young people. Right now, the world is full of contradictions. Subtle disparities in attitudes are exposed as deep divides. Young people everywhere will need to have faith in themselves to buscarse la vida, to find their lives. Everyone's life is affected by social and political movement, whether it involves staying behind or venturing forth. I wonder what my life would have been like if my parents had stayed in Puerto Rico and I had been born there instead of New York and raised in the Bronx. I imagine Cubans wonder how their lives might have turned out if they had stayed in Cuba or if Castro had never gained power. Though the revolution affected the characters in coming up Cuban differently, they all prevailed, hearkening back to the displacements of my own people, I wondered what it would be like to be them. As I researched, I felt empathy for young people who managed to rise past Castro's shadow. I put myself in the shoes of kids on my sister Caribbean island, Cuba, which is what I hope readers of this book do, put themselves in the other person's shoes. Looking back in my own life, I see how faith in myself enabled me to navigate through adolescent minefields to find my way clear to audition for and create the character of Maria on Sesame Street. The faith my characters, Ana Miguel, Sulema, and Juan have in coming up Cuban have in themselves makes them prevail because as usual, the young will see their way out of darkness. Someday, the rest of us will follow suit. Well, in any way, finally, that is what I hope to suggest to the readers of Coming Up Cuban. Gracias. Wow, Sonia, thank you so much. I cannot believe, I know it was a slightly different narration, but I cannot believe that this started as a picture book. <laughs> I know. It's just like I just it, that's the remarkableness of making a book. Uh, it just starts one way and you get influenced by so many things. As a matter of fact, I feel I can share. I'm sorry uh, uh, with Lisette Serrano that uh, 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 who will be our moderator, who's our moderator. Uh, 
I was stuck with Sulema and I didn't know why this character wasn't gelling. And I read on Facebook, Lisette said something about her cousin. And I went, that's it. Sulema needs a cousin. I mean, it's very Latin to have a very close relationship with a cousin. And all of a sudden, uh, uh, Lisette inspired this, this cousin character in Sulema's story. So uh, another example of the journeys that a book can take. Absolutely. And the, and the ways that our, that our book community supports and, and uplifts all of us, even, even creators. That's amazing. Yes, yes. And now, Kaysen Callender. Kaysen is a best-selling and award-winning author of multiple novels for children, teens, and adults. Their debut novel, Hurricane Child, came out just four years ago this March and received the Lambda Literary Award and the Stonewall Award. Their second middle grade novel, King and the Dragonflies, won the National Book Award as well as a Coretta Scott King Honor and the Lambda Literary Award. At Scholastic, we are so thrilled to be Kaysen's middle grade home and to have their new title, Moonflower, publishing this summer. Kaysen, welcome. Thank you, Emily. So I would like to begin my talk with a trigger warning. Moonflower and my talk today both discuss mental illness, depression, and suicidal ideation. So please take care of yourselves if this isn't something that you can listen to. So Moonflower is about 12-year-old non-binary Moon who escapes into the spirit realms every night. They want to find a way to never have to return to their physical body or the world of the living again. But when an evil force threatens the spirit realms, it's up to Moon to find a way to save the world of the spirits. This is a very personal story for me. When I was 12, like Moon, I would try to leave my body so that I wouldn't be alive anymore. And I would pray whenever I went to sleep at night that I wouldn't wake up again. Also, similarly to Moon, therapy and medication did not help me when I was young. I had bad experiences with therapists. One said that I was just looking for attention and another shamed me for my suicidal thoughts. Whenever I took medication in my later years, it was numbing and it didn't help to heal me. And my depression followed me into adulthood and it was only until a couple of years ago that I found a path to healing that was right for me. I became more aware of the consciousness of the universe. And I realized that as a piece of the universe, I am in fact the universe as is everyone around me. I realized that because I exist, I am perfect exactly as I am in the same way that the moon is perfect just because it exists too. I considered the possibility that I actually wanted to experience a life as case and calendar and that I would not have known and truly appreciated the joy and love for life I have started to find if I didn't know pain and heartache first. I realized that our true being is made of immense joy and love more than we can even comprehend and that hurt and pain is often created by cycles of trauma. The people who hurt me did so because they were hurting too. I don't believe that anyone who sees how worthy and lovable they are exactly as they are would feel the need to hurt others. That helped me to feel compassion and this allowed me some freedom and release. I realized that I don't need permission or validation from others to be here and to be loved exactly as I am. If a person tells me that I'm not worthy, it's because they themselves do not feel worthy. I deserve to be here and I deserve to exist. These realizations are what ultimately helped me. I wanted to write Moonflower with these personal truths for the younger me who desperately needed them. I was also very aware of the safety of young readers while I wrote this book. I showed Moon's emotions authentically, but I did not want to trigger any readers. I wanted to be sure not to share the overwhelming depressive thoughts that I have, that I have experienced and would have filled every page. So for every painful thought that Moon has, I wanted to ensure that their pain was respected and acknowledged and not dismissed in the way that I think we adults tend to dismiss children's valid emotions, but I also wanted to offer both Moon and the reader hope to counterbalance Moon's pain. Moonflower was also one of the most difficult books I've written, if not the most difficult. It was difficult to return to that place of depression. The act of writing for me is joyful and healing and expressive and loving. So to willingly return to depression, which can suck away so much of that joy, made the process of writing much harder than usual. To push through that difficult process, I wanted to create a spark of joy and balance the story with what I hope is a fun adventure that young readers especially can enjoy with loving characters who guide Moon on their path. 
I also played with the setting of this world. Moon moves back and forth between the spirit world and the world of the living, and the world of the living isn't quite our world either. I began writing this book in the heart of the pandemic in 2020 without knowing what our world would look like today. And I decided to keep in what I imagined the world might look like due to the pandemic as a way to mark when this book was written and to acknowledge that the pandemic has also had a major effect on mental health. I'm not attempting to cure anyone's depression or suicidal ideation. I believe that these are personal journeys in the same way that the lessons that Moon learns that helps them and ultimately helped me were personal too. But I do hope that something may resonate for readers. And I hope that readers of any age will be able to walk away from Moonflower feeling just how loved they are and with the knowing that they deserve to be here simply because they exist. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kason. Um, so much of what you said is so resonant. And, and I know that, that many of the people here are in these conversations and and know the people who who need this book, who will need that that respect um, and that direct communication. Um, I I really love I love everything that you said, and I I just this book is going to be so meaningful for so many, and I'm so looking forward to everybody having the chance to read it. Thank you. Thank you. And now. I'd like to invite all of our authors back to the screen to join us to speak a little bit more about their book's creation process and have a conversation. Well, I'm going to go out and get each and every one of these books. <laughs> you know, it sounds so good. Oh what, is there out? what a diverse bunch of books. Yeah. I know. <laughs> We are, we are we are really blessed with all of your books, but they all have connection. And so when yeah, when you said the topic, I was like, oh, you wrote that for me. No, you. They all they all fit that. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, that's I mean that's that's the beautiful thing, and I think you know you, you all as as incredible creators and and. You know, as as Kason was saying, authors who are respectful of your readers' experiences and realities and and different lives, um, you're really able to tap into some really important um, topics um, and beautiful ways of sharing information and stories that might be might be challenging, but but still are important to engage with. Um, for my first question, I want to ask how how you keep motivated as you as you write. Um, I'll I'll sort of uh, call on you if anybody wants to go first. You can you can note that in the chat, um, but uh, in our, our private chat. Um, but uh, but yeah, how do you keep motivated? Um, I know as you research, as you write. And then um, perhaps the most challenging as you revise. I know some of these books have been a long time coming, um, either as books of your heart that are now out in the world or um, or uh, or just for time um, from from editorial process. Um, Kat, do you want to go first? Yeah, I can go first. Um, let's see. I feel like inspiration hits me differently for each project. But for Miss Gintzes, since it's like a semi-autobiographical work, um, I drew a lot of uh, inspiration from like my own experience uh, with my Gintzes and even going through like, like uh, embarrassing photos of myself as a quinceanera, like all these like photo albums that we had and just going through them and then just uh, I don't know, just like getting experience, like uh, inspiration and even photos of like um, since the, the the book takes place in Honduras, that's where my mom's family is from. Um, even looking at like old photos of family members of like these settings and stuff. Um, every time I, I looked at pictures, I got more ideas for what could happen in each chapter, how characters can look like. And so I based all my characters based on family members and how they appear and such um, and the relationship with each other. So it's kind of nice to kind of... Um, get inspiration from, from my life that way. Um, and just reading like a bunch of like 
uh, middle grade graphic novel work to kind of help me put into like the spirit because um, making graphic novels in general is just like really hard, but like keeping yourself motivated after drawing, uh, inking, uh, lettering and, and such um, like 200 plus pages, uh, it's a lot. So <laughs> it helps to have like, you know, some books on the side that can kind of um, get your creative juices flowing and, and just keep in being inspired. Um, it's, it's hard to make graphic novels, but it's also very rewarding once it's done. So I'm like really excited to see like the final, final product um, aside from like, you know, the proofs and stuff, which is like also amazing, but um, yeah. <laughs> I know it's a journey with uh, with graphic novels, especially with the with the whole the whole process. Really, um, anybody else want to volunteer? Going next? Well, I, I just might add to what Kat said. It's like solving a puzzle. I, I you know, it's like a book is like solving a puzzle. You have an idea here, and then you have to put all the pieces together to get to to that idea. You know, so that it all ties up with me, and that's that's my experience. And uh, you know, you find inspiration where you least expect it. Something somebody says on Facebook, oh, that's the answer, or you know, or uh, you know, because your mind is like working on it when you're not when you least expect it, and then you get the answer. Co, do you have any any thoughts to share? <laughs> well, this was the longest book. This book took me the longest to write. And I don't want to say how long it took because it's very embarrassing. But um, yeah, I think for me, it was, I was always uh, motivated to write it. And it was a lot of, I had a lot of questions about how to tell the story. And I tried it a million and one ways <laughs> until I found the one that worked. And so what kept me motivated, kind of like what Kat and Sonia were saying, is just trying to figure it out and figure out how to do it and just find the story and find it in the way that works, you know? So it's, um, it's like, I have to figure it out. <laughs> so um, yeah, um, I guess it's, it's easy to stay motivated. It's just hard sometimes to to get it right the first few times. Oh boy. I know that revision process is real. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, it took me six years to write this one. So don't mm -hmm. feel bad about it taking a long time. Maybe it's a Bronx thing. I don't know. <laughs> it took me over 12 years mm -hmm. to write my first one. Wow. So that, but this one was actually perhaps the easiest one to write um, in part because it was like sort of um, wish fulfillment of my own life because it's where I grew up and how it could have been. Um, and also it's, it's my pandemic book, right? I was, I lost a couple of months to staring at the wall and then I needed something to do during the day and helping these kids was a lot easier than looking at reality. Mm -hmm. um, and then once I have a draft, I'm better at revising than drafting because then all I have to do, I don't have to like build granite. I just have to like pick at it and play with it. And yeah. then there was a book. That's amazing. And Kason, do you, do you have any thoughts on the process? on the motivation, keeping motivated? Yeah, as I mentioned, this is um, definitely, uh, this was a hard book to write, if not the hardest I've had to write. So the motivation piece, I feel, came in, uh, I don't know, I don't know if anyone else here feels this, but I feel like it can get painful to not write sometimes. Like, I, it's almost like a constant pull. Like, if I try to stop writing for a month, I'll probably start to lose myself. It's, it's like my therapy. It's like how I express myself. I feel like my purpose is tied into it. So even though it was so difficult and sometimes I would try to force myself to take a break from it because I feel like taking space from that in the same way that Sonia was mentioning earlier, like your mind percolates and gives you the answers. Sometimes I would try to give space to allow the answer to come to me. And I still kind of felt like pulled back to needing to write. So. 
Yeah, and that sort of leads into um, my next question, which is all of you have sort of talked about like these these moments of of inspiration and um, and connection that allowed you to 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 move your book forward. Were there were there any things that surprised you? Um, a moment. Um, where things came together in a way you didn't expect, um, a theme that emerged, um, a plot point that resolved in a different way than you'd originally thought that it might. I know, I know sometimes there are those surprises along the way. I guess for me, the biggest surprise is that there are poems in this book. I, I don't know where that came from. I, I don't know. I've never written a word of poetry in my life. And it was so much fun writing like really great seventh grade poems. It was just really just uh, a joy, just a joy. I had a researching surprise. Ooh. Uh, so well, and it is a, it is a minor spoiler, but I'm I'm going to allow it. Um, I wrote this entire book about these kids getting this local queer icon put up as a statue and I was so excited that I had found this person and then I was trying to research other folks that I could like put in as as second best to be competitors. Ms. Audrey Lord lived on Staten Island for about seven years including when she wrote a lot of her most important uh, essays. So I had to restructure things and figure out how to not take my story apart, but also to respect Ms. Lord. Um, that was a challenge that I wasn't prepared for. That's amazing. I feel like, I feel like Staten Island has, has some secrets. <laughs> oh, lots. <laughs> Yeah, when you do when you're working on like a historical novel and you have to you have the events in front of you, you know, this 59, 60, 61, and this happened, and you want to be true to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, but you also want to be dramatic and cram events a little closer together so that you have a more exciting. <laughs> so, you know, it's a real ba balancing act to be, uh, you know, true to what really happened and and. But, it, you know, it's like making a movie. you got to do the high points or the highlights or, you know, th this is only in historical novels, which I'm leaning more, loving more and more because I do love the research process. It's just fascinating. And you really do bring it to life. <laughs> yeah, and then you have to bring it to life. You know, you can't just say it because then it's, his, you know, then it's a history book. You have to, mm. you know. Create the color, create the engagement. Yeah, right, right. So, Kason, any uh, any surprise moments for you in the process? I have a boring answer for this one. No, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's okay. He's so got it down to a T. No problem. No <laughs> worry. Pumps up the book. <laughs> we can we can count the whole book as as the revelation. <laughs> Um, I guess uh, for me in particular, um, I'm so used to, so prior to this graphic novel, I used to self-publish my own like comics and, you know, zines and such. So this was the first time that I was working with an editor um, to work my story, which was kind of like a very painful process because I never had that experience before. Um, so like just remembering the first drafts of my story is like completely different to what it ended up being. Um, which I'm okay with. Like, I, I, I love how the story ended up with um, at the end, but like, it's just, uh, I was not expecting that at all for some reason. And, and just like being very emotional throughout the, um, the process as well. Uh, because like, as, as a kid, you know, you're embarrassed by like the things that kind of tie into like your culture um, as you try to assimilate into like the US, um, like society and culture. So like for me, having my gate says was a very embarrassing thing. And I didn't want to look at my photos at all for years. Um, I'm just like, it happened. I'm never going to tell my friends. Like, I don't want to like show my embarrassing photos of like my awful haircut, my green contact 
uh, lenses and like braces. Like, I don't want to see that. But like, um, as I was trying to get inspiration for the story, uh, going like revisiting these photo albums, I got like really emotional because I'm just like, oh, like this was actually an important time of my life. Like, I'm so glad I, I can like be uh, like, feel feel pride for that moment um and kind of thankful that I had that opportunity to to like have a quinces because a lot a lot of kids you know aren't able to do that um because I found out later like my my parents saved up money uh over the years for it because it's a very expensive like you know celebration so like knowing that information now I kind of grew to like appreciate it more as an adult um and I just got really emotional making the story so like Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, that's something I like discovered <laughs> throughout the process. <laughs> that's beautiful. I love that. I love that this is this is this has been this has been so personally connected, um, and that it's really helped to give you give you more understanding and more knowledge of, <laughs> of your own experience too. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and I think um, we are on to our our last question and. Um, feel free to answer however, however you like to this one. If you could write a letter to one of your characters, what would you say? It doesn't have to be the main character. Um, you know, it's just a message that you would, that you would share at the beginning of the book, at the end of the book. Um, what would you want to say to your characters? I think I'll go first because I feel like I kind of already said it in my talk, but I would tell myself in the same way that I was telling Moon that they are perfect exactly as they are. And I think that's a message that a lot of kids need to hear. Um, and I think it's going to resonate beautifully. Thank you. Anyone want to follow follow that? <laughs> I know, I know that's the that's the message that um, that we we really want to give kids. Um, all of us do, um, and it's important for them to hear it. I, I guess I would, if I would, my favorite character is Juan, the last character in uh, Coming Up Cuban, and I would, and who stays, and uh, uh, I, I would want to him to know that he's not forgotten, that uh, 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 that we have faith that he'll find his way. Mm. I guess that's would be. That's beautiful. <laughs> I guess the main thing would be just to tell my main character, Caprice, that, you know, it gets easier. Speaking as somebody from personal experience, you know, what you've went through in your childhood, you know, with some help of whatever kind, it does get easier. It's uh as you get older, just hang in there. I think I would send a letter to my main character in the beginning to something that they do, I think, figure out a lot of during the book. So I don't know that they need my letter, Um, but your people are everywhere. And there are lots of different types of relationships not everything is a pure friendship there you can have adults in your life that aren't your family but that doesn't mean they're your peers there are other ways of connecting with people in the world i love that Mm -hmm. these are really good ones um (laughs) um i i guess for my character sue uh i would like to let her know that it's okay to be different, um, whatever that may be. If you're like the weird one in the family, that's totally fine. It's not a weakness, it's a strength. And you may not realize it now as a kid, but as an adult, you're gonna fully embrace that. And you know, that's gonna, you're gonna find like-minded folks and you're gonna have a blast. But you know, like, like Ko said, just hang in there. Like it's gonna get better. Oh gosh, I love this. I feel like I, f- I feel like I'm getting inspired and uplifted, and I hope all of you in the audience feel this as well. Feel this love um, 
we're coming to you from a screen, but we are coming to you with our hearts. Um, so thank you for being here. Before we go, I wanna give a special thank you to our ASL interpreter, Faith, who has done such a phenomenal job um, and, uh, and helped us so much. Thank you, Faith. <laughs> um, just to close out, um, we know that books change minds, change hearts, and books can change the world. Um, you all do so much to bring these stories to your readers. Thank you. Thank you so much and happy reading. Bye. 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 Thank you. Mm.